I just want to say yet again, hello everyone and welcome. I want to welcome you to the SACNAS Professional and Leadership Programs webinar series. Today's webinar is How to Be an Effective Mentor. My name is Elizabeth Aguilera and I am the SACNAS Professional and Leadership Programs Manager. I am coming to you from the original homelands of the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes in Aurora, Colorado, and we are so glad that you joined us here today. We also have my wonderful colleague, Angel, who is a SACNAS team member and will be the chat moderator for today. SACNAS is a fully inclusive organization dedicated to achieving true diversity in STEM. As the nation's largest multicultural and multidisciplinary STEM diversity organization, SACNAS creates space where all members, volunteers, and partners feel they belong and can embrace their intersectional identities. SACNAS is based out of California, which is the original homelands to over 200 tribal nations, bands, and rancherias of Native American and Indigenous people. The dark blue region here is actually the region that represents where I reside in Aurora and is the region of the Cheyenne and Arapaho territory. I would like to take this time to acknowledge the original inhabitants of the various regions where we all live and work, as well as honor the rich culture of the indigenous people across the country. It's our pleasure to coordinate and host these informative and educational webinars. For today's webinar, we actually have a great panelist of speakers. We have Martha Zuniga, who is a professor of uh, molecular cell and developmental biology in the Department of Molecular Cell and Developmental Biology at UC Santa Cruz. We also have Stephanie Ramos, Associate Director of Undergraduate Research at Oregon State University. We also have John Sebastian Augusto, who is the Associate Dean at College of Arts and Sciences at George State University. And then Kathy Peltier, the University Hiring Programs Manager in HP Print Division at HP Print. How are you all doing today? Awesome. So we're actually going to jump right into the Q&A portion of this webinar. I want to encourage all of our attendees to please use the chat feature or the Q&A feature uh, within the Zoom chat and submit your questions. And then we're going to go right and get started. So I wanted to ask the panelists the first question, which is, what does being a mentor mean to you? For me, it's a relationship between two people who are learning from each other. You know, usually it starts out a little one-sided, but it very quickly becomes um, a more trusted relationship, an advocacy, um, building networks, but it's basically two people who really are learning from each other. I have never mentored without learning something from the people that mentored me back, so. I agree with that, um, but. Okay. To me, the most important thing about being a mentor is listening carefully and asking good questions um, so that I can really understand and get to know my mentee well. For me, I guess um, being a mentor is really kind of a natural display of my talents and strengths. Um, I know that when I'm in that role, that I'm really trying to help that person develop to be their best self, um, that I want to work with them to help them achieve their own professional goals and help them see their own future. Um, for me, being a mentor means uh, the opportunity to have a relationship, whether that be short-term or long-term um, with an individual or a group to be able to support them to be their best authentic selves, but also to um, ensure that they have the support, whether that be for me or someone else, the resources that they need to be able to access um, opportunities that they are interested in. Uh, so I take the job very seriously. Wonderful. The next question I have for you is, how do you define the role of a mentorship? And also, are there different styles of mentorship? And what is your specific style that you find to be most effective? I'll go ahead and call on John. So um, for me, I define the role of a mentor as someone who I'm working with um, to achieve a goal or set of goals. Um, I tend to be I tend to find mentees that are very task oriented um, and I tend to um, be very explicit in my 
um, approach. There's different styles of mentorship. I kind of see it as different mentorship roles. Um, some are more professionally oriented, maybe towards work or towards if they're a university student or a graduate student, uh, maybe they're in a leadership role. Um, and some of those may be more personal, like a, a peer mentor, uh, someone who provides uh, kind of emotional guidance or social support as a, as a, as a mentor. Um, and kind of there's a third part of that. My role, how are different styles? What was the third part, Elizabeth? What is the style that you find is useful uh, for you or most effective for you? I tend to find uh, the universe provides opportunities to do mentoring for people on more of the professional side. Um, I, I don't know if it's just because of who I am or what I attract or combination thereof, but I, I tend to find mentees that are looking for a goal or looking for a set of goals. And so um, we try to be very explicit in those goals. And sometimes that's helpful to them just to kind of write down and think about and talk out loud what that goal is. And so uh, I try to draw that out as much as possible. I mean, it is true that students come to me for mentorship, but if I, if, if I see a student or a junior colleague whom I think is in need of mentorship, mentorship I seek them out um, and try to engage them. It, I think those are the people who need the mentorship the most. Uh, students or colleagues who who are seeking a mentor are going to find a good mentor, but the, the people I worry about are the ones who are kind of lost in the woods and either are too timid to seek a mentor or who don't know how to seek a mentor. That's great. Um, the, you know, the different styles that I see in mentorship, it, and I think it depends on the mentee. There are people who come to me for very directive, focused, task-oriented, as, as John mentioned, and that's easy. It's a, you know, ABC, here's the steps to do it. Let me walk you through it. Let me help you. There's other where people have come to me for much vaguer, you know, like I need help with communication. Well, that's pretty vague. You know, we're going to need to talk for a while on that one. Right. And so there can be, there's a little bit more depth to that, maybe a little bit more sharing. Um, you, you start getting into where your comfort zone is and isn't, and that can be a little vulnerable. Um, you know, so some of it, it, it all depends on what someone comes to me, what their request is. And right. so I think it's up to me to listen. And I think Martha mentioned that before, but also uh, there's an element of almost emotional intelligence. You know, they, they'll come to me and say, well, I need help with communication. So it's probably email. And it's like, well, let's, uh, let's peel that back a little bit and, and getting that comfortable feeling and that trust so that we can get down to the very nuggets of what needs to be um, addressed or worked on. So that's, that's uh, pretty much, yeah, I love the listener role though. You know, I think there's different roles that kind of my colleagues were touching on. So I think there's, you know, the, the task oriented, I think there is some emotional support. I think I have a lot of students that maybe come to me um, for a lot of emotional support because they don't have anyone else that they can go to. And I feel that my role, um, you know, kind of allows for that, but they might be looking for skills or guidance um, and I feel it is my job to connect them to those folks if I'm not the best person who can do that. So, you know, who are the colleagues if they have a specific thing that they need? So, um, you know, I think for style, I really try to adapt to the student because they're, everyone has a different style. So what's John's approach and what's Kathy's approach and what's Martha's approach may be completely different from mine. And I think what I'd like to just highlight is there is no right approach. It really is um, if I use the same approach for every single student, I think I wouldn't, students wouldn't come to me because every student needs something different. So it's really an assessment. Mm -hmm. um, and I think just the most effective way to do that is to be authentic. Um, if you don't know something, if you do know something, if you can refer, if you follow up. Um, but I also put a lot of that on the students of like, what do you need? And let's get clear if they don't define it. Um, here's what I think. And is, are you in agreement with this? So. And I actually have a great follow-up from, question from the audience. So it seems like Martha and, and everyone is saying you kind of want to reach out to the people who, who might not be the ones reaching out to you for that mentorship. But what were to happen if you had a mentee or were trying to con contact a mentee, but you couldn't really connect with them? So how do you find common ground or how do you rectify that interaction or relationship? I actually had that situation 
not in my current role, but in my previous role at the University of Kansas, had a student that, you know, um, I have when I work with a student in this type of in this capacity, I have what I call my user manual. It's a set of kind of as you would buy your refrigerator to you get the user manual. When you when I become your mentor, you get my user manual. And this person started arguing with me about my user manual. And I was like, like, this is how I work. I know myself well enough to know what my talents and strengths are. Well, you should do it this way. I'm like, that's a really good idea, but that's not me. And I'm not being authentic if I, if I do that. So I want to bring my most authentic self to you. What was interesting though, was I, I, I really tried not to get defensive because that would have shut down the conversation, mm -hmm. but rather it made me introspect and say, well, why am I that way as a mentor? And it really allowed me to, and I, and I appreciate it. And we actually did eventually work it out but it took a lot more on the front end of what he was looking for, what I was able to provide, what I wasn't able to provide as a mentor. Um, and just really, it, it took time to, to really, I'll use this word, ground that relationship. We're in, with other individuals because we had a more of a common language, the grounding took less time because there was enough, there was enough there to build on, if you will. Does anyone else have either a similar experience or, or advice on how to, to connect to those people who, who might, it might not feel so easy to connect with? Yeah, I do. I, I was trying to type it up. I think it's a little long, um, but so a couple of things. I have peer mentors within our program. So I use those mentors as a way to bridge and like, hey, can you connect with the student? So it kind of removes that power dynamic as like a first level. If you don't have peer mentors or students, um, employees that can do that outreach for you. Um, the second thing that I did um, was looking at the student's major. I, I, a lot of students on campus join clubs. And so we know what all of the clubs are. I actually went to one of the affinity group meetings. I found out when it was, I showed up to support. And this one of the students was actually there. And from that, like the student hadn't been responsive via email. I then learned that the student had a lot going on and why they weren't responding, but it was also an opportunity to talk about why we do respond. But I think seeing me outside of my role in a different location also removed that barrier of that power dynamic of like, I have to go to their office and I'm in trouble. And so I think switching up the location and also trying to meet students where they're at, you know, I, I think that's important, kind of like what um, John was saying too. We want to make the connections and sometimes showing up is, is the way to go. Um, and that requires a little bit of extra time and effort. But once you get over that, you actually get more buy-in from students. So all of the work I put in up front now that work kind of speaks for itself because students now have, they know a history of like, she will find you where you're at somehow through these meetings and, um, you know, show up to support and ask questions. So I think there's ways to do it. I do something similar. It, um, I have a lot of undergraduates who work in my lab. Sometimes if I'm having difficulty mentoring a student, I talk to other students in the lab. I don't betray any confidence, but I tried to get the other students to work with the student who needs mentorship. And especially if it's a student who's really benefited from my mentorship, I'll have them have a conversation with the, the student who needs mentorship, but with whom I'm not connecting so that, um, so that any barrier is dimin hopefully diminished. And I have found that to be quite effective. Especially if, because mentorship is tough love, you sometimes have to deliver uh, something that a message that the student doesn't want to hear. If, if they hear it from a peer or they, or the peer says to them, oh, I had that same problem, but Martha helped me work through it this way. Then it, it develops a, a, a trust that might not have existed previously. And mentorship is easy if you're just being a cheerleader. I think it's much harder when you have to deliver news that the student or the person who needs mentoring doesn't want to hear. I think that's a lot more challenging job. Agree. I'm actually going to segue into a question from the chat that kind of touches on that. So how do you support students who might or might not be on the right STEM path, whether it be maybe they're struggling in this 
uh, yeah. their courses or how do you come to that conversation of maybe you should rethink the path that you're taking? So I'm not in education, but I've had a fair number of, well, first off, I have two sons that are in their 20s and we've had to have that conversation of, you know, what is it that you like about your major? And they'll rattle things off. And I'm like, wow, that's great. And I, you know, and then I'll say, you know, I see your strengths as X, Y, and Z. And so tell me how those two are going together. Are they really fitting for you? And, and it's by questioning and maybe have, helping them to look. You know, I don't have somebody else's answers. I cannot come from the outside and say, you should go into electrical engineering. You know, I, I can ask the right questions to help you sort things out. And so um, a lot of times I will ask questions. You know, my oldest son loves working outside and he was going to school for economy. And I just went, oh my God, you're going to end up in a cube farm. <laughs> right. And, and I talked to him about working outside. And of course it made all the difference in the world when his, when, he, when it dawned on him that he needed to change to forestry and, and you know, and he's, he found the niche he needed to find. But I find that by asking questions, um, I don't know what the words are, but I'm going to say in your face. It's much less um, confrontational if you can ask someone open questions and really listen, because what you might have assumed doesn't always hold true. You know, sometimes people are like, oh, I hate this class and I'm not doing very well in it. Well, nobody does well in PCAM. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, um, So it may be your life's calling and it's still tough. So... I think yeah. Kathy, hit, Kathy hit that out of the park in terms of response. But I think it, it, the one thing I want to emphasize is the asking questions. I think a lot of times, I'll, I'll use undergrad students specifically, they come to our doorstep, they, they want assistance, and they want answers. And it's really tempting sometimes to say, do this, 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 and this, instead of taking that little deep breath and saying, let's ask some questions about that. I had a student in a situation where uh, when I was at the University of Kansas, we had national fellowship office and I saw a lot of those students when they didn't get the fellowship and you had to get them to let them kind of absorb that a little whining never hurts, right? Just a little and kind of absorb the decision. And when it was appropriate, get them to pivot to what's next. What's the next opportunity? What's the next step? We know, I know this hurts, but what's, you know, and to really, what would that look like? And get those questions out there so they can start thinking and say, if you have something you want to give, say, you might want to rent this idea for a day. Just rent this idea for a day, state your idea and say, if you don't like it after a day, return it back to me. I'll gladly take it back. But get them to ask questions and, and get them to think so that they have some ownership and some agency in, in, in these choices. I would like to add to that because I specific, I work closely with STEM students for a couple of years now and a large majority of our students are STEM. Um, what I will say is that the, we're questioning the students right now and I also like to flip that back to questioning ourselves as potential mentors as the ones that students are coming to. Um, and the reason that I say that is because oftentimes it's like their grades aren't good, they must exit. And I think that's how we don't increase diversity within STEM fields. And so I think there is an, an honest question um, and also just planning with the student. If this doesn't work out, what other options might there be? And I'm not the only person that you should be speaking to about this. I'm not an advisor. My, my job is not academic advisor. However, I do think that students should get more opinions and here's my thoughts and you have choices. I really like John's phrase about rent this idea for a day, I'm gonna use that. Um, really just sleep on it, but know that you're the decision maker and not ever putting this as a student needs to leave the, the STEM field or the STEM academy. I, I just feel really strongly that as mentors, we need to also be questioning ourselves when those things are happening so that our default isn't, well, your grades are bad. You should probably go into you know something else. So. I'm just thinking for the students. I would like to follow up on both something Kathy said and what Stephanie just said. So here at the UC Santa Cruz in our biological sciences, we have several biology majors and one of them is uh, molecular biophysics and biochemistry or something like that, I can never remember. Anyway, it, it, it heavy emphasis on biochemistry, thermodynamics and all of this kind of stuff. and. It, it, it's, it's a demanding major and lots of students do very badly when they get to some of the more advanced courses like thermodynamics. 
and and they'll be complaining about how badly they'll be doing and i'll say what what, what do you want to do <laughs> once you've graduated what what do you want to go to graduate because i'm talking specifically about not students who want to go to medical school although there's that cohort as well but the ones who say they want to go to graduate school and one student in particular that i recall kept saying that she just thought she'd get into a better graduate program if she was this particular major, biochemistry and molecular biology. And I said, but what do you want to do? And she says, cancer research. I said, well, I, I, I beg to differ. I do not think that this particular major is going to make you a more attractive candidate. And if you're doing badly in your classes, it may well make you a less attractive candidate. I wanted to hear you say you wanted to be a BMB major because you really love chemistry. But if, you, if you're using it as a ticket into graduate school, you really need to rethink this. Don't, you might be dazzled by the major that it sounds lofty, but that doesn't mean that the admissions committees, the graduate programs are going to be dazzled. And you really need to think about what's going to train you what, what is going to give you the best education for your career goal and not what you think looks good on paper, especially if it's sinking your grades. Thank you for that. We do have another question from the chat or Q&A, and it is, can you expand some more with tips on how to get students to respond when they are not doing so, particularly when you've indicated that a response is needed? Now, this is where I think and I think Stephanie talked about this, building a, um, a mentoring system as opposed to being a mentor. Um, peer mentors can help you build a mentoring system. So if you have students that you need to have contact with and you're not getting the contact you need, oftentimes a peer will get that response that you need. So going to yeah. them and saying, hey, I haven't seen Rose in a week. It's been too long. Do you, do you have her number? Can you reach out to her? Let's let's have a conversation. I have even gone so far, and I'm not advocating this, um, looked up the student schedule, knew they had an English class, happened to be walking by the classroom as they walked in. Oh, Stephanie, I, I needed to see you about something. When you're done with class, can you come see me? And, you know, those are happy little accidents that I wouldn't advocate doing this for every student because that's a lot. But sometimes, you know, you have to be creative. I, I want to I think about this from a different perspective, too. I mean, I, I have a lot of questions for the question, which is about, like, how have you set up a mentor relationship or how have you set up a relationship period with the student beforehand? Because I think that also impacts the approach. So, for instance, if you've done, like, team building, like, just, you know, events or just, like, get-togethers or game nights or dinner or, you know, holiday party, et cetera, depending on which students you're referring to. I serve a lot of students, so I'm thinking of just my core team. But in this regard, when, you, when you've done that, you've built that up. Um, and so I think that also can impact how you approach, um, you know, needing to talk to someone. So I always tell students when I'm meeting with them, like, hey, I, I know life is happening. I might take some time to respond. That might happen for you. But in order for this to work, I need communication. So I think when you set that up up front is like the key mm -hmm. indicator. I think that's my biggest thing is like, you know, I know stuff happens, but the more you communicate with me, the less I'm going to be bugging you, the less I'm going to be having to search for you. Um, and also that's the expectation when you get a job. I don't want you leaving here, going to a job at potentially HP and not res being responsive, right? Because, and going anywhere really. So I think we have to be better with how we set up that initial meeting. Um, and I'm very upfront with students about that piece of, we have to communicate in order for this to work. Otherwise it's one-sided and it won't work. I really like that, Stephanie, because I think telling people, look, if, if ever it gets to be too much, you know, just text me and say, can we meet in two weeks? Right. Because I know midterms happen and finals and the rest of it, and you might be getting a cold and your parents need something. And, you know, it all happens and heavens, sometimes it happens all at one time. And I don't want them to start like, thinking, oh, I haven't answered her email yet. Now it's been a week and I haven't answered her email. Now I have to avoid her because I haven't answered her email. Right? <laughs> I don't want it to go down that path. And so have it, having it be okay to press the pause button and say, I need a break. How about I get back with you in a week? Perfect. Yeah, I love that, Stephanie. I have uh, two somewhat similar questions uh, in the Q&A. 
So the first is from Jessica. Can you talk about signs of stress and or overcommitment and how you approach these topics with your mentees? How do you best promote self-care and what resources do you offer? And then the second question, which is very similar, if a student is struggling with something personal, how do you help them and learn about their issues without being too nosy or making them feel uncomfortable? Signs of stress from students, they're, they're very clear. They'll stop responding or their responses get really short. Um, and so I have a thing with my students is like, you know, I, I need to take care of myself. And so trying to emulate that can be very difficult at times, but let's look at your schedule. Do you have a lunch built in there? Are you taking care of yourself? What is your, your go-to self-care technique? So we do have these questions, even at our group meetings, um, of like, what is it that you're doing right now that is helping you? And you need something to do that with, um. And we have a, a, there's a lot of resources through our campus, right? So I'm a big mental health advocate. And so letting students know that, you know, it's okay if they need to talk to someone and I'm not the best person always to be that shoulder. That Sometimes it's a lot too. Um, and so it's really just kind of tapping in and it, you have to be knowledgeable about that, but you also have to be willing to like hold the student's hand and walk them over to these resources if they need it. Um, and then I think using those resources myself, it's like, I disclose that to the students because I'm like, you know, I do this for myself and I want you to know that it's totally okay. And so I think some of that building trust with students comes from those conversations. Um, and yeah, I think one of the, the language that I use to not be nosy is like, you know, what would you like to share with me or how do you want me to support you right now? Or what, how, in what ways can I be supportive? Um, that's going to keep you moving forward. So you don't need to ask details. And I say that, like, I don't need to have details. If you want to share, I'm here for it. But really what I care about is your well-being. Um, and I think students respond to that. Either they don't say anything or they do say something. Um, but yeah, I do a lot of mental health, exercising, meditation, free online yoga videos, YouTube, um, you know, and then coloring, just whatever the students need. So I, I think there's plenty of resources. It's more about looking at their structuring their time to be able to do it. I think part of it is also understanding, um, you know, li like, like Stephanie said, listening and being able to say, you know, sometimes all you have to do is look at somebody and say, wow, you look like you've got a lot going on today. And then there's this, or, or yes. And, and you can say, well, you know, is there anything I can help with or support you with? And then stuff will come out, you know, oh, this happened with my family or I've got three, three things due this week or whatever. And, you know, and that question of how can I support you is, is uh, priceless because it leaves the, it leaves it in their court. I don't have your answers. I can't tell you what to do. Sometimes I will say, well, you know, I'm feeling stressed today. How about we just go for a cup of coffee? Because I think that would give me, you know, that, that emulation or that, that example, it would give me a little bit of downtime to just breathe and letting them know that sometimes that's okay. And that's what you need and finding ways for them to find that, that breath. So I actually want to touch, I don't know, John, did you want to say anything or add on to that? No, that was all good stuff. I, I have nothing to add. Yeah, I mean, these are all great responses and I really appreciate it. Keep, keep them coming. Um, I actually wanted to touch a little on something John said, which was this user manual um, on mentorship of what to expect from me in this, in this relationship. Did you make that sort of on your own? Is that standard practice and or what resources did you use to formulate that um, and or where can others find those types of resources? So I'll start. Um, how I got a user manual was I was given a user manual. Um, I had a graduate dean. I was an assistant dean in the graduate school at the University of Kansas. And my dean, uh, her first day, walked in and said, here's my user manual. I was like, what? Like, you know, people don't have user manuals. And then I started thinking about, yeah, we do. We just don't maybe say explicitly, this is my user manual. For me, I'm into strengths development. So I took the Clifton Strengths, which is an assessment that measures people's natural talents. I took that, took my top five, and I wrote my user manual. So I'm a high achiever, big on development, very much future focused, and love to talk strategy. So I'm a problem solver. And so all the things up in my user manual are based on that. And that worked for me. That it, you know. 
what works for somebody else might be something totally different um, because of their who they are as an individual. But it also helps to, if I'm in a formal relationship with a, with a mentee, then I can write a contract and say, okay, if this is my user manual. This is our contract together. This is what I will give. This is what I expect from you. We talked about communication, some other things as well. Setting those clear expectations really helps, I think, kind of set the stage to help to help move things forward. Does anybody else use anything similar or is there maybe an internal user manual that you share uh, just when you, you start that relationship with a mentee? Um, I don't have a user manual, but you've given me this great idea. Um, and John, my strengths are complete opposite of yours. I'm like developer and individualization and harmony and all this touchy feely stuff, um, which is kind of weird in engineering. But um, but I do have a punch list. It's like, you know, what is it that you want to be mentored on? Do you have a timeline? You know, are they learning this in behalf of some deadline? I ask, how motivated are you to learn this? You know, if this is being dictated to you, versus something you're really interested in that helps me set some some boundaries and some uh, of the stage a little bit you know and then we talk about communication styles communication frequency meeting frequency you know what is it if you can't make a meeting etc and then I just capture all of that and I shoot it out in an email and say hey our conversation today I captured the key items just wanted you to see what I heard and make sure we're on the same page and that's our contract you know so there's um, you know, nothing more formal than that, but I, it, it is, you know, the punch list that I go through with everybody. I, I'm a little bit like you, Kathy. I don't really have a formal user's manual, but I do have certain things that I always want to tell students about. So one thing <clears throat> here at UCSC, most of our uh, bio biological science majors, the vast majority of their classes are quite large. And for particularly for shy students, they never really get to know a professor. Perhaps they don't go to office hours, or if they go to office hours, it's held in a large room with a bunch of people. And then they're getting ready to graduate, and they want to go to graduate school or professional school, and they need letters of recommendation. And they say, oh, I'm, and I'll ask them who they're going to request letters from. And the student might say, oh, I'm going to ask my cell biology professor, my genetics professor, because I got an A in that class. and say, well, that's great, but there were 300 students. Did you ever, I mean, do you think the professor can pick you out of a crowd? Did you establish a relationship? And nine times out of 10, the answer is no. So <clears throat> what I try to do is get my mentees early on and say, you need, you know, faculty are faculty because we want to teach. We want to have relationships with our students. None of us wants to be standing in front of a room of 300 people and not getting to know them. But it's up to you to try to cultivate a relationship with a faculty member so that then later, if you are applying to graduate school, the person, the faculty member, isn't going to just look you up in his Excel spreadsheet from when you took cell bio and scratch his head and try to remember what grade you got. You know, you want the letter of recommendation to be fulsome and and informed of, of the student's strengths. And that doesn't come from knowing that you got an A in, in, in the course. So I try to catch my mentees early enough and start, uh, they're, they're not thinking of asking these questions. I'm anticipating what they're going, uh, once I know what their career goals, I'm anticipating what they're going to need. And I'm trying to help them do things in an effective manner that will uh, enable them to achieve those goals. Thank you. We have a question in the chat that I um, I know Stephanie responded to, but I just want to make sure uh, the rest of the panelists get a chance to respond. So how would you become confident as a newer mentor? Are there specific trainings uh, that you attend? Where do you find these kinds of resources? But also, how do you respond to scenarios or questions that you don't know the answer to? Oh, well, that's never happened. <laughs> I'm only kidding. <laughs> the list of things I don't know is endless, trust me. Um, and, and that honesty is what you put right on the table at the get-go, is to say, I'm not familiar with that, or I've never done that before, or wow, that's a stumper, or whatever it is. And then I say, you know, but I think I know somebody who might be able to help yeah. us. And now yeah. I'm helping them build a network 
and I'm hoping I'm, I'm showing them what it's like to not know and still make progress. Um, so that's, you know, I, and that's part of being a mentor. Usually you're, you're in an area where you are more experienced, you have a bigger network, um, you have a bigger support system. So part of being a mentor is helping them grow their network. And so the more we can do that together, um, the better. And, you know, sometimes it's like, I'll noodle on something and, and then be like, oh, I found this TED talk or I found this website or I found this and, you know, and just shooting stuff back and forth. And then as they come across things and share it, it's like, oh, this is great. Okay. Well, now we know more than we did last week. You know, there's a ton of resources out there. And sometimes it takes talking to four people before you find somebody who knows somebody, but okay, let's do it. There are some great, uh, Stephanie just posted one and the Peak House STEM Leadership. Um, it's for me, it's always been an amalgamation. I just kind of collect things, things come my way. People say something and like, oh, that's a good idea. I write it down. I totally agree, Kathy. Nothing impacts a mentee when you say, that's a great question. I don't know the answer. Let's figure it out. Let's work together. And rather than tell them you need to network, you show them how to network. You say, hey, I know Stephanie in Oregon State. Let's call her. She may have answered to this. And then you, you're showing them, this is how people network with each other. And mm -hmm. it really allows them into the system that you're building and into your thought process. And they get to see, oh, I, I'm, it's, not a, it's not a bifurcated relationship. We're, we're equal. We add different things to this. I, I was first generation college. And I remember coming into jobs and thinking that there were the people who knew things. And then there was me. <laughs> you know, and me and the other, the other new hires, right? And just, just assuming that if I worked hard, I would get this knowledge and, and didn't feel comfortable networking because I didn't know how it worked. I didn't know you should just walk up to people or that you could get a reference from somebody or, and so, um, you know, showing them that that's how it works and helping them get that confidence to, you know, walk up to somebody. And what are the, you know, two or three sentences you're going to say as your introduction to get them to help you? Um, is is priceless. So, and now I walk up to everybody. I, I think they see me coming in to this. Sorry. I have another question for um, you being the mentors. If you're not actively seeking out the individuals that you think uh, might benefit from having a mentor, and let's say you're just getting asked multiple times from several different individuals to, to that are seeking your mentorship specifically, how do you manage how many mentees you have? Um, and also, is there a limit for you? I, I can go. Um, I think this is a very tough question as a woman of color at a predominantly white institution, um, higher ed institution, because I feel like the, the numbers are lower for students, like there's a high need. And so I've have found more recently that it's challenging to kind of turn a student away. And so I'm always willing to at least initially meet with a student, get them set up or give them some tools or point them in the direction or make that connection with, for them. Um, but then I also just emphasize, you know, I, I try not to um, let students feel like I'm the only one that they can do that with. I say, I'm here. I, you know, I'm happy to support. I will do what I can. I kind of couch that with, if I'm able to help, I will. So it's a very honest and intentional, not saying I can help everybody. Um, but I also think too that in connecting them and building relationships with my colleagues across campus, I'm actually in knowing interests. I feel confident in being a connector is kind of one of my strengths is making sure that they, they have that connection with someone else and kind of highlighting that they need more than one person and that I have more than one person. I don't just have one person that I go to for everything. It's, it's too much. And I think when students realize that, then they start to think like, oh, I do need to be making more relationships and here's how I start. Um, so I have a lot, I don't wanna say how many students I mentor because it's a lot. Um, and they come to me for various things at different times. But I think the consistent thing is, is that I, sh I let them know when they need me, I can, I'll try to be there. And so I think once you have established a good relationship and get students off, they really are like, fantastic. They just, they get it. They move forward. Um, and then when you emulate good mentoring techniques, they start to do that themselves. And the students start making connections with students and the students start pointing students to the right direction. So it really requires, again, that, the little bit of work up front, but 
it pays off in the long run. Um, I guess I'll go. Uh, so my previous role at the University of Kansas, where I was directing our Center for Undergraduate Research, directing our Center for Service Learning, overseeing the National Fellowships Office, um, I came in contact with a lot of students who were in those, those spaces of community engagement, service learning, national fellowships, and undergraduate research. And what I found worked best for me was that I scheduled time, blocks of time in my schedule to meet with students um, in small groups, twos and threes, um, especially if I could group them because of a topic or a, an issue. Um, sometimes there was some cross pollinization going on between the different areas. Um, and I had those weekly meetings where they knew they were gonna get my time. And they and I would show on my schedule and say, here's my schedule starting at 7.30 and going till six every day, Monday through Friday, and here's your time spot. And again, being explicit, be transparent. I can I can fit you in here and we'll get things done and we'll we'll address any questions you have. And of course you can text me and all that, but that's your time. So let's let's make sure we can productively use it wisely. Um, again, getting that system set up where you're comfortable and not feeling like you're straining you know, one student at a time, try to bead them together into, into some, some common themes. And then some good peer mentoring goes on, like Stephanie said, some good peer mentoring can happen. Thank you. I do have another question and that is from when you started as a mentor, would you say that your mentorship style has changed? Have you noted that um, or how has it changed? Hopefully, obviously for the better. Oh, of course it's changed. I'm not the person I was 20 years ago, thank goodness. Um, but, you know, I think I was a little bit more directive. You know, it was like, oh, you need to learn something? I'm going to pump this information into you kind of approach and make you successful. And and it, that's overplaying it, but still, I think now it's more about um, the guiding and the supporting and the relationship. And yes, they still want to learn something. And yes, they they have goals. But I think it's it's become a more connecting and softer approach, um, and hopefully more supportive. I mean, I've had mentors or mentees tell me some amazing personal things, and and realize that that was a, a really big trust. And and as a part of the whole who they are, um, you know, it helped to put the picture together and helped to support them better. Um, but yeah, it's definitely changed over time. It's it's gotten, you know, some things have gotten crisper. You know, I know what to how to set up the relationship at the beginning. Um, I'm a little clearer on instructions and what I can do, what I can't do. Um, it's more relationship based. Um, but oh, it's definitely changed. Yeah, mine has changed more. It's changed drastically, and I think the one way that it's changed is involving more of the peer mentoring than I did before. I think before I tended to just think, oh, I have to be a mentor by myself and I, or refer them to another colleague who might be a good mentor, but I really am trying to harness the power of peer mentorship more than I did at the beginning. Uh, I feel very young in, in my mentor mentoring, but I, I think in just a couple of years, I definitely have changed. And so uh, I think I ask better questions now, um, you know, I think the questioning, learning how to ask really strong questions or questions that make students think that isn't just like, well, here's what you need to do, or here's my unsolicited adv advice. And sometimes I give that and sometimes I don't. Um, and then one thing that I learned recently that kind of is a, I'm practicing and I'm not perfect at yet is um, how to shift that power dynamic as I realize I'm moving up and changing in my career. Uh, and so instead of just offering my advice, even though I feel like I have an answer, I'm like strategic and have a lot of ideas. Um, what I've learned from another mentor was to say, you know, um, I have some thoughts on that. Would you like my advice? And so you've shifted that power dynamic by just even allowing them to have a choice. Um, and so it's very powerful to think about how we give up that power and how our language is powerful. Um, for those interactions. Um, and so I'm, again, I like to give the free advice, but then I'm like, do they want this? And what does it look like when I ask them instead of just giving it? And so it's a little shift that I'm still trying out, but I do think that there is something about power dynamics that as I'm changing that will I'll continue to reevaluate. For me, I guess 
um, you know, being in hiring now 30 years, I think I was a horrible mentor uh, early on. I, I, I just, I, I thought I was there to solve problems and solve, you know, students would come to me and I'd solve their problem. And I'd feel good about myself because I solved their problem, which I probably didn't listen very well. It's what made me a bad mentor. Um, I think I've really tried to um, learn from others, um, kind of take from me different mentors that I've had, some things that I've liked, um, going back to starting and knowing myself better as an individual and what I bring to that type of relationship um, really helps me as well. Um, because I, I know, I know my lane and I know what I'm, what I can do well and what I'm not comfortable doing or not good at doing. And so I won't try to do that. Um, but I will encourage them if they want answers from that, that lane, um, let's figure out how to, how to find those, um, by asking good questions and, and networking and doing some of the things we've talked about. Well, we're just about going to hit time. I think we have time for about another question or two. We have one from an attendee, and that is, the academic landscape is changing rapidly. Many students are questioning whether they should continue in academia. I am a woman of color who was lucky to land a great academic faculty job, but I am struggling with figuring out how to inspire my mentees to stay in academia. Do you have any suggestions? I think Martha, Martha should take that question first. <laughs> You know, actually, I feel as if the NIH itself is working against us on this, because now, for example, for our training grant, we're pretty much required to have workshops and other kinds of opportunities for them to learn about careers outside of academia. And the emphasis seems very much careers outside of academia. So you're almost swimming against the tide to try to <laughs> counter that. And I find that Perplexing. <laughs> yes, I realize that there's not enough academic jobs for all of the students who want to go to graduate school. And yes, we should tell them about other opportunities, but it feels a little bit as if it's at the expense of encouraging them to consider careers in academia. And I'm astonished at how many students, not just here at UCSC, but when I did my sabbatical at Yale, I saw it there too, that there, our graduate students aren't thinking of going into academia. They're all thinking about something outside of academia. So I'm thinking the pendulum might swing in the opposite direction that in several years, we're gonna to have to be trying to have workshops to encourage them to stay in academia. I try to point out to them the benefits of an academic career. Uh, and I think that's a really effective way to give back it, it's the, I, I can better envision that I'm giving back more effectively by being in academia than I would be if I was working for Biogen or Amgen or some gigantic company. And mm -hmm. so I point out the value of teaching and of mentorship that you're going to do less of if you're in industry. Mm -hmm. Definitely. There's, there's a totally different balance. And, and, you know, there's times when I've had to come up with my own workshops or panel discussions to augment what you know, is, is kind of being um, encouraged, right? And it's like, wait a minute, there's no balance here. It's like, all right, I'm gonna create my own workshop and get people into it just to have that, um, that, uh, that visibility, right? And, and to be able to speak openly about why I'm jazzed about what I do. Yep. Yeah. Um, I, I've done workshops with grad students and with postdoc researchers um, about this, this topic, you know, keeping undergrads and interested in science and interested in a career in academia and academic research and you know one of the things i say is they they notice they look they see and if you come into the lab and you're like you know two hours of sleep and stressed out if you if you can't demonstrate some type of life balance and i understand it's difficult mm -hmm. they'll see that and they'll go i do not want that i don't know what that is but i don't want it in my life and, mm -hmm. and the truth, same with our young faculty here at Georgia State, um, you know, we have a great group of uh, faculty in our College of Arts and Sciences, and I talk to all the new hires, and I say, if you want students working with you, you have to show them, a, 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 be a good example. And sometimes it's putting a little bit of a face on and saying, yeah, things are great, even though the grants do in a day, and I still haven't gotten that time to write, and, you know, all those things, it's, it's, 
you got to be honest. You got to be sincere, but you got to also the mm-hmm. best way people learn is by the demonstration that you give them. And we've all had good mentors who demonstrated something that we valued and said, oh, I want to emulate that. Mm-hmm. Right. Oh, if I have time, I just like to add to that. I, I'm a chemist by training and a part of the American Chemical Society as well as SACNAS and for ACS. Um, we actually push that there are jobs outside of academia, mostly because a lot of people that graduate as chemists are not gonna go into academia. So it's a very competitive and small job market, um, especially for folks of color, it can be uh, you know additional challenges and barriers. And so I think it behooves us as mentors um, and individuals to be able to say that there are other opportunities and finding a fit that works for them. Um, because if that's what they want to do, then we make those connections. And if that's not what they want to do, I don't think it, it, it's fair to try to force people into this um, field if they're not ready for it. Um, so, you know, more to, to think about on that. But there's just so many jobs that are going unfilled in STEM fields in general. So how do we funnel students to those positions? Thank you. Well, we are right at time. I want to thank everyone one who is in the audience for your wonderful questions. And of course the panelists for uh, being so insightful and providing answers to those questions. And that's gonna conclude our Q&A portion of this webinar. If you enjoyed today's webinar, you can find upcoming and previous webinar recordings on our website at sakanas.org forward slash webinars. And then actually immediately following this webinar, you will be sent a survey that takes less than three minutes to complete And as members, your feedback is very critical to us. So we ask that you please take a few moments to submit the survey and let us know what you thought about the webinar today. Your your feedback will help us improve our future webinars and identify future topics for you. That will conclude our webinar. I want to personally thank Martha, Stephanie, John, and Kathy for taking the time to join us today. And we will see you next time. Thank Thank you for including us. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.